thank you very much for allowing me to be with you today. Um, I know this was uh, put out as D best vitamin. And I want to tell you that the first, I'm going to unbury the lead. Rather than calling vitamin D a vitamin, I want you to know that the point today of everything that I'm going to talk about is to tell you that vitamin D is a hormone. <laughs> it works like a hormone. Um, and it's not, so it's not what we typically think of as a vitamin at all. When I talk to patients about another hormone that lots of people know about, which is thyroid hormone, I explain that thyroid hormone is something that helps keep the whole body moving smoothly. And I make the analogy that just like if you have a, the body and you think of it like a car, food for the body is like gas for the car. And thyroid hormone for the body is like, uh, uh, or sorry, yes. So thyroid hormone is like oil for the engine. In other words, it makes everything run smoothly. In the same way, vitamin D is a hormone that works throughout the body different ways, keeping the structure of the body going strong and functioning well. Um, it works in the bones and uh, we know a lot about what vitamin D does for keeping calcium, uh, the calcium levels in the body normal and keeping our bones strong. We also now know that it works in the tissues. It works, it helps with strong muscles and it helps with regulating cell growth and proliferation in the breast and the lung and the prostate so that it regulates overgrowth, right? It helps attenuate things like tumors. Um, and then also we know that it works in the immune system and it enhances what we call the innate immune response, the thymus or the, 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 the immune response that is that we are all born with. Vitamin D enhances that. So I'm going to get, get a little bit technical here just to make my point. This is a cartoon that shows a cell. And we see here that this is the vitamin D. This is thyroid hormone. Both of them work the exact same way. They go, the, the vitamin D goes across the cell membrane into what we call, this is the nucleus of the cell or the center of the cell. And it, met, it meets up with a vitamin D receptor and they form a two-part or a dimer, a two-part molecule that attaches to the DNA. Every cell has DNA, which is a recipe book for the job that the cell does. This two-part molecule attaches to the DNA and causes the DNA to be read and a new and send out instructions for the cell here in the cytoplasm to put together a new protein that causes the biologic response that we are trying to get. Both vitamin D and thyroid hormone look, work exactly the same way on cells throughout the body. What differs about their effect is the kind of cell that they work on and what part of the DNA they go to. But it's the same process, which is why we look at both of these as hormones. So let's step back a little bit. This is to remind you that um, this is the sunshine. Sunshine touches the skin. And in the skin, we have cholesterol-like molecules that get changed into something called cholecalciferol, which is the vitamin D that we take, right? It's the, that's, the, that's the molecule we take when we take it in the pill. 
in the liver, it gets changed to uh, a metabolite. And then again, in the kidney or the bones or the prostate or the breast or any of the other uh, tissues, they get to, gets turned into the activated form, which is here, the activated form of the hormone called 125 hydro dihydroxy vitamin D3. In this particular slide, it just talks about the bone and the calcium metabolism, but usually the, the point of the, the entire slide is just to show you that mother nature intends us to get sunshine and in our skin, the sunshine causes this series of reactions that causes us to have enough activated vitamin D3 to keep our body chassis working well. Okay. So let's, how did we learn about this? It's, we know that vitamin D is not a, it's not a nutrient because we don't generally eat it, right? It's not really part of what we eat in our normal diet. We discovered vitamin D deficiency because when human beings moved to higher latitudes, to areas where they lived indoors, right? In colder climates, um, they lost the amount of sunshine that they were exposed to. And so we as a race or as a, as, a, as a population started developing this problem with vitamin D. It became in the 1600s when people were migrating to towns and living in urban settings, they were living in, you know, in, in tight urban settings. And they started noticing that children were developing a, a condition called rickets, which I'm showing you a picture now rickets is is just poorly developed bone and very these are very soft very soft malformed bones so um i'm thinking that many people have heard of the word rickets and have seen this but thank god most of us have not seen it in our own children right so in the 1820s they noted that if you sent children to the country, sunlight helped, right? And their rickets, actually, they got better as they got older. Then in 1919, they discovered that cod liver oil was an anti-rachitic. An anti-rachitic means that if you took cod liver oil every day, that you were protected against Dis developing this disease that caused these sort of soft, spongy bones. So people of my parents' generation were given cod liver oil. And I remember when my dad was alive and I gave this talk once for him and he was there, he burst out laughing, thinking, you know, just, and I don't know if anybody in the audience now remembers having been given cod liver oil as children, but most people do not remember that as, as something that they looked forward to every day because it tasted nasty and it repeated on you, right? So um, anyway, in the 1920s, when we discovered radiation, you know, when we have a new technology, a new technology means we try and use it on everything. When they irradiated corn oil and olive oil, they found that that had the same effect as giving cod liver oil, and it tasted a whole lot less nasty, right? So that gave the opportunity for people to fortify foods in order to give, to solve this problem that was um, recognized that vitamin D was missing in people's diets, and this was solving it right? So they started fortifying everything. They fortified milk, they put it in bond bread, they put it in twang soda, they put it in hot dogs, they even put it in Schlitz beer. And I have to say, this is something that I found on the internet that um, a colleague also showed me in a slide, and I just thought was too fun to pass up. I always enjoy showing this slide. <clears throat> As we know, 
when sometimes when things get taken too far to one side or the other, you know, too much of a good thing is not a good thing, right? And in the 1950s, they discovered that school, English school children in particular were coming down with cases of vitamin D toxicity, which manifested as having very, very high levels of calcium. The children became very ill. They became nauseous. They had stones. They had, they had abdominal pain. Uh, they had depression. Anyway, and so at that point, when they realized that the problem was that these children were not only getting tons of vitamin D in their hot dogs and in their milk and in their cereal and, and everywhere they were eating, they were getting vitamin D. They were also getting out and playing in the sun. So they were getting overloaded with vitamin D and they did get toxic. So in Europe, they completely banned all vitamin D fortification. And in the United States, they limited it to milk and cereal that could be fortified with vitamin D, but nothing else. So since then, as we've been learning about vitamin D, um, we've had to develop ways to actually test for it accurately. And that took a while. And then they started doing observational studies where they looked at whole populations and just tested everybody to find out, well, you look healthy. What is your level? What is the level we should be going for? And they tested people that were um, surfers and lifeguards who were out in the sun all the time to say, what was, what was that level? What was that normal level that mother nature intends us to be going for? So that we know what, what we should, you know, how we should supplement. When we, uh, as science advanced and we became better at molecular biology, we identified something called vitamin D receptors. We, identi we actually identified the molecule that is the receptor in the, um, in the different cells. And we realized at that point, if you, if you find vitamin D receptors in certain tissues, then there probably is some kind of action that vitamin D takes. And it turns out it was not just in the bone. It was in the prostate, it was in the breast, it was in the lung and in the immune cells. So at this point, people usually ask me, well, can I just take my multivitamins? And the, the not enough <laughs> for a lot of reasons, but basically that multivitamins don't have enough vitamin D. I wanna talk quickly about the research that came out in the last year. In February, a journal of virology came out and said, and looked at studies that showed that um, people who were coming down with COVID oftentimes had low levels of vitamin D. So these, these two pies on the, the A side, or on as you're looking at it on the left, show in the blue area, this group of people had very low vitamin D. On the B side or the, to the right, it was the people who did not have COVID. And it was a smaller portion of people who had very low vitamin D. The people on the left side, the A side, are the COVID positive patients. As we keep going in the orange section, these are people that have low, but not desperately low vitamin D. And still, they, there were quite a few people that had low vitamin D. And then it looks, what I think is noticeable in both cases is normal levels of vitamin D all around were still very low, right? So basically there's a lot of population, even in non, these are all hospitalized patients, either with COVID or without COVID, but a lot of people had low vitamin D. But they made the case that it may be that vitamin D would be protective because more people that were COVID positive had very, very low levels. They also made the case, they looked at these CT scans 
And in the upper left corner, the A section, I'm not sure how that projects for you. This was these, this is a CT of somebody who has very, very low vitamin D. And they showed and they made the case that people with the C had very people with low levels of vitamin D had worse looking CT scans of their lungs. They had more, um, they had more lesions here. This patient down here is someone who had COVID but had normal vitamin D. And they were trying to make the case that the lower the vitamin D level, the worse you were, the, the, the greater your likelihood to get COVID and the worse your prognosis might be. Then in March of 2021, the University of Chicago looked at 3,000 patients who had had a vitamin D test within 14 days of getting a COVID test. And they found that in those three, of those 3,000 patients, if they had higher vitamin D levels, that may protect against COVID. Only, they found that only to be the case in people that were that were in were were black and not in non-black patients. In May following that, there was another study which tried looking at types of genetic mutations within vitamin D to see if that showed a correlation between a likelihood of getting COVID or not, and it was negative. And then in July, because there were so many people that were so desperately ill, they thought, well, given that we think that vitamin D might be protective, we're going to try treating with vitamin D. So they took patients that were in the ICU, the intensive care unit, and they gave them an injection of 300,000 units of vitamin D3. Oh my God. <laughs> so that's a lot. Remember that you and I, if we are taking vitamin D tablets, we're probably taking one or 2,000. And so they actually were injecting 300,000 units to these very, very sick people to see if that would help. And unfortunately, it did not. It did not help at all. So I want to, at this point, just go back to my initial statement. Vitamin D is a hormone. And if you think of my, my analogy of, if you think of vitamin D as like that chassis and, you know, as maintaining the chassis, right? It's kind of like, if you don't want rust on your car, right? You do the rust proofing, but it doesn't help once you have the rust and the car's all falling apart to throw rust proofing on it at that point. So I think it's not a surprise, although I think it was worth trying, just in case we don't completely understand this, right? That giving 300,000 units of this, of vitamin D yeah. wouldn't help once people were so desperately sick. Yeah. At this point, I think what I'm going to do is open it for questions this is just, we'll just put this here. This is just uh, to remind you of the levels that were defined back in 2003. A level of 30 or greater is considered optimal. My personal take is 40 or greater, but, but that's what's standing right now. Um, and then the insufficient and deficient levels of vitamin D. So Roberta, shall I see if anybody wants to say something or ask something? I have. Uh, Lexi, I have uh, lost the chat. Okay, so I can tell you there's one question in the chat so far, which okay. is how much sunshine daily do you need to get adequate vitamin D? And then while you're answering that, um, I invite other people to add their questions to the chat, which are starting to come in now. Okay, so that is a great question. Um, I think I actually even have a slide. Yes, boy, 
I, I'm, I would like to say that I actually put this person up to it, but this is great. Sunlight is the best, most reliable source of vitamin D, okay? And we, we talk about minimal erythemal or minimal redness doses, right? So if you are out in the sun for 15 minutes and expose your hands and face and arms and legs to uh, two to three times a week, about 15 minutes, that will do it for you. Does that help answer that question? And remembering that in Boston at this time of year, you can go out in your birthday suit and you won't get enough, right? Because the, the sun is too low in the sky to give us enough adequate UVB light. So this is why Roberta, I think, likes to do this talk in the fall because getting your vitamin D level checked now right, tells you how well you're stocked up to get yourself through the winter. Thank you, Dr. Schneider. Uh, the next question is, what's the best way to get vitamin D if recent blood, uh, recent blood uh, chats, it says, have shown low levels? I'm not sure what chats means. Oh, it's probably tests. Oh, um, tests, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Boy, I wish, <laughs> I actually, okay, so yes. Um, sun exposure supplements are good. D3 of the two supplements is better than D2. And you can look on the supplements labels. I have another slide that shows those labels, but you, uh, you can also get vitamin D in oily fish like salmon or tuna. It turns out that people that live in the very far North uh, like the, um, you know, indigenous, the Eskimos who live on whale blubber have actually <laughs> very adequate levels of vitamin D because whale is a very oily fish and they get plenty of vitamin D in their diet because needless to say, they don't get a lot of sun. Um, but usually oily fish like salmon, salmon and tuna, cod liver oil, right? Which we had talked about before, which you can still get, it's nasty. So um, this is just pictures of, you know, the different kinds of fish that can help. You can get vitamin D in fortified milk, but it's not very much, but yes, you can definitely get it there. And then the tablets, If we're looking at what to look for in the drugstore, it's always vitamin D3, which is cola calciferol. So I like to tell people to look at the labels because some, that, some vitamins say that the serving size is four tablets. And it turns out that in order to get the amount that you think you're getting, you have to take as many tablets on the label. So it's always important to look at, look at those labels and check the serving size and then check and see how the vitamin D is. Is there another question? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Schneider. So the next question, there's a comment associated with it, but I think the main point that, that they raise, which I think is really uh, an important one to cover is speaking about um, the risk of skin cancer uh, when trying to get vitamin D uh, and also that vitamin D um, is photosensitive and may be break down with prolonged sun exposure. That's the statement there, which I, I would be helpful for you to con comment on. So that is really a great question. So it is true. Mother nature doesn't allow us to become toxic with vitamin D just from the sunshine. When the body senses that there is adequate levels of vitamin D in the body, then um, the molecular reaction that happens in the skin sends the vitamin D down to a different pathway, which goes to an inactivated form of vitamin D. That is mother nature's way of protecting us against toxicity. The reason that the children in England or anybody that gets toxic on vitamin D 
became toxic was because they had, they were taking the vitamin D orally as well as getting the sunshine. Did that, so, and oh, okay, that was the first thing. So yes, mother nature does protect us. And then the other part of that question was, of course, worrying about skin cancer is huge, right? When they talk about an, a minimal erythermal dose, the thought is that this is uh, so that if you're outside in the sun and uh, you press you press on your um, you press on the skin and it's you you get very very light you just very very barely notice um, redness. But that said, if you are somebody who is likely to get get skin cancer, you have a skin type that um, increases your risk of skin cancer, of course, that is not the best way to do it. No question. And we're very lucky. We live in the 21st century. You can get vitamin D other ways. Great. And can fish oil help? Or pills, fish oil pills help? So I think some of the fish oil pills, you have to look at the fish oil pill and see if it actually has ergo uh, cholecalciferol in it. Um, some fish oils are not like salmon, or, you know, from salmon, right? Uh, so I guess possibly not all of them. So I think that um, takes care of all our questions. And thank you so much, Dr. Schneider, for a very interesting and informative uh, presentation. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, join us next month when we talk about, uh, we have Dr. Jennifer Wilson talking about um, screening for lung cancer. And we have our uh, treatment, smoking cessation treatment, information from CHA. So thank you so much, Dr. Schneider, for taking the time to be with us today. Oh, it was my pleasure. And thank you all for joining. See you next month.